Section four of All of Grace by Charles Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Concerning deliverance from sinning. In this place I would say a plain word or two to those who understand the method of justification by faith which is Christ Jesus, but whose trouble is that they cannot cease from sin. We can never be happy, restful, or spiritually healthy till we become holy. We must be rid of sin. But how is the riddance to be wrought? This is the life or death question of many. The old nature is very strong, and they have tried to curb and tame it, but it will not be subdued, and they find themselves, though anxious to be better, if anything growing worse than before. The heart is so hard, the will is so obstinate, the passions are so furious, the thoughts are so volatile, the imagination is so ungovernable, the desires are so wild, that the man feels that he has a den of wild beasts within him which will eat him up sooner than be ruled by him. We may say of our fallen nature what the Lord said to Job concerning Leviathan. Wilt thou play with him as with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? A man might as well hope to hold the north wind in the hollow of his hand as to expect to control by his own strength those boisterous powers which dwell within his fallen nature. This is a far greater feat than any of the fabled labors of Hercules. God is wanted here. I could believe that Jesus would forgive sin, says one, but then my trouble is that I sin again, and that I feel such awful tendencies to evil within me. As surely as a stone, if it be flung up into the air, soon comes down again to the ground, so do I, though I am sent up to heaven by earnest preaching, return again to my insensible state. Alas, I am easily fascinated with the basilic eyes of sin, and am thus held as under a spell, so that I cannot escape from my own folly. Dear friend, salvation would be a sadly incomplete affair if it did not deal with this part of our ruined estate. We want to be purified as well as pardoned. Justification, without sanctification, would be no salvation at all. It would call the leper clean, and leave him to die of his disease. It would forgive the rebellion, and allow the rebel to remain an enemy to his king. It would remove the consequences, but overlook the cause, and this would leave an endless and hopeless task before us. It would stop the stream for a time, but leave an open fountain of defilement, which would sooner or later break forth with increased power. Remember that the Lord Jesus came to take away sin in three ways. He came to remove the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and at last, the presence of sin. At once you may reach to the second part. The power of sin may immediately be broken, and so you will be on the road to the third, namely, the removal of the presence of sin. We know that he was manifested to take away our sins. The angel said of our Lord, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Our Lord Jesus came to destroy in us the works of the devil. That which was said at our Lord's birth was also declared in his death. For when the soldier pierced his side, forthwith came there out blood and water, to set forth the double cure by which we are delivered from the guilt and the defilement of sin. If, however, you are troubled about the power of sin, and about the tendencies of your nature, as you may well be, here is a promise for you. Have faith in it, for it stands in that covenant of grace which is ordered in all things and sure. God, who cannot lie, has said in Ezekiel thirty-six twenty-six, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. You see, it is all I will and I will. I will give and I will take away. This is the royal state of the King of Kings, who is able to accomplish all his will. No word of his shall ever fall to the ground. The Lord knows right well that you cannot change your own heart and cannot cleanse your own nature, but he also knows that he can do both. He can cause the Ethiopian to change his skin and the leopard his spots. 
Hear this, and be astonished. He can create you a second time. He can cause you to be born again. This is a miracle of grace, but the Holy Spirit will perform it. It would be a very wonderful thing if one could stand at the foot of the Niagara Falls, and could speak a word which should make the river Niagara begin to run upstream, and leap up that great precipice over which it now rolls in stupendous force. Nothing but the power of God could achieve that marvel. But that would be more than a fit parallel to what would take place if the course of your nature were altogether reversed. All things are possible with God. He can reverse the direction of your desires, and the current of your life, and instead of going downward from God, He can make your whole being tend upward toward God. That is, in fact, what the Lord has promised to do for all who are in the covenant, and we know from Scripture that all believers are in the covenant. Let me read the words again. A new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 11:19. What a wonderful promise! And it is yea and amen in Christ Jesus to the glory of God by us. Let us lay hold of it, accept it as true, and appropriate it to ourselves. Then shall it be fulfilled in us, and we shall have, in after days and years, to sing of that wondrous change which the sovereign grace of God has wrought in us. It is well worthy of consideration that when the Lord take away the stony heart, that deed is done, and when that is once done, no known power can ever take away that new heart which He gives, and that right spirit which He puts within us. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance, that is, without repentance on His part. He does not take away what He once has given. Let Him renew you, and you will be renewed. Man's reformations and cleanings up soon come to an end, for the dog returns to its vomit. But when God puts a new heart into us, the new heart is there for ever, and never will it harden into stone again. He who made it flesh will keep it so. Herein we may rejoice and be glad for ever in that which God creates in the kingdom of His grace. To put the matter very simply, did you ever hear of Mr. Roland Hill's illustration of the cat and the sow? I will give it in my own fashion, to illustrate our Saviour's expressive words, Ye must be born again. Do you see that cat? What a cleanly creature she is! How cleverly she washes herself with her tongue and her paws! It is quite a pretty sight. Did you ever see a sow do that? No, you never did. It is contrary to its nature. It prefers to wallow in the mire. Go and teach a sow to wash itself, and see how little success you would gain. It would be a great sanitary improvement if swine would be clean. Teach them to wash and cleanse themselves, as the cat has been doing. Useless task. You may by force wash that sow, but it hastens to the mire, and is soon as foul as ever. The only way in which you can get a sow to wash itself is to transform it into a cat. Then it will wash and be clean, but not till then. Suppose that transformation to be accomplished, and then what was difficult or impossible is easy enough. The swine will henceforth be fit for your parlour and your hearthrug. So it is with an ungodly man. You cannot force him to do what a renewed man does most willingly. You may teach him, and set him a good example, but he cannot learn the art of holiness, for he has no mind to it. His nature leads him another way. When the Lord makes a new man of him, then all things wear a different aspect. So great is this change, that I once heard a convert say, Either all the world is changed, or else I am. The new nature follows after right as naturally as the old nature wanders after wrong. What a blessing to receive such a nature! Only the Holy Ghost can give it. Did it ever strike you what a wonderful thing it is for the Lord to give a new heart and a right spirit to a man? You have seen a lobster, perhaps, which has fought with another lobster, and lost one of its claws, and a new claw has grown. That is a remarkable thing. But it is a much more astonishing fact that a man should have a new heart given to him. This, indeed, is a miracle beyond the powers of nature. There is a tree. If you cut off one of its limbs, another one may grow in its place. But can you change the tree? Can you sweeten sour sap? Can you make the thorn bear figs? 
you can graft something better into it, and that is the analogy which nature gives us of the work of grace. But absolutely to change the vital sap of the tree would be a miracle indeed. Such a prodigy and mystery of the power of God works in all who believe in Jesus. If you yield yourself up to his divine working, the Lord will alter your nature. He will subdue the old nature and breathe new life into you. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will take the stony heart out of your flesh. He will give you a heart of flesh. Where everything was hard, everything shall be tender. Where everything was vicious, everything shall be virtuous. Where everything tended downward, everything shall rise upward with impetuous force. The lion of anger shall give place to the lamb of meekness. The raven of uncleanness shall fly before the dove of purity. The vile serpent of deceit shall be trodden under the heel of truth. I have seen with my own eyes such marvellous changes of moral and spiritual character that I despair of none. I could, if it were fitting, point out those who were once unchaste women who are now as pure as the driven snow, and blaspheming men who now delight all around them by their intense devotion. Thieves are made honest, drunkards sober, liars truthful, and scoffers jealous. Wherever the grace of God has appeared to a man, it has trained him to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. And, dear reader, it will do the same for you. I cannot make this change, says one. Who said you could? The scripture which we have quoted speaks not of what man will do, but of what God will do. It is God's promise and it is for him to fulfill his own engagements. Trust in him to fulfill his word to you, and it will be done. But how is it to be done? What business is that of yours? Must the Lord explain his methods before you will believe him? The Lord's working in this matter is a great mystery. The Holy Ghost performs it. He who made the promise has the responsibility of keeping the promise, and he is equal to the occasion. God, who promises this marvelous change, will assuredly carry it out in all who receive Jesus, for to all such he gives the power to become the sons of God. Oh, that you would believe it! Oh, that you would do the gracious Lord the justice to believe that he can and will do this for you, great miracle though it be! Oh, that you would believe that God cannot lie! Oh, that you would trust him for a new heart and a right spirit, for he can give them to you! May the Lord give you faith in his promise! faith in his Son, faith in the Holy Spirit, and faith in him, and to him shall be the praise and honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen. By Grace Through Faith By grace are ye saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 I think it well to turn a little to one side that I may ask my reader to observe adoringly the fountainhead of our salvation, which is the grace of God. By grace are ye saved. Because God is gracious, therefore sinful men are forgiven, converted, purified, and saved. It is not because of anything in them, or that ever can be in them, that they are saved, but because of the boundless love, goodness, pity, compassion, mercy, and grace of God. Tarry a moment, then, at the wellhead. Behold the pure river of water of life, as it proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. What an abyss is the grace of God! Who can measure its breadth? Who can fathom its depth? Like all the rest of the divine attributes, it is infinite. God is full of love, for God is love. God is full of goodness, the very name God is short for good. Unbounded goodness and love enter into the very essence of the Godhead. It is because his mercy endureth for ever, that men are not destroyed, because his compassions fail not, that sinners are brought to him and forgiven. Remember this, or you may fall into error by fixing your mind so much upon the faith which is the channel of salvation, as to forget the grace which is the fountain and source even of faith itself. Faith is the work of God's grace in us. No man can say that Jesus is the Christ, but by the Holy Ghost. No man cometh unto me, saith Jesus, except the Father which hath sent me draw him. 
so that faith, which is coming to Christ, is the result of divine drawing. Grace is the first and last moving cause of salvation, and faith, essential as it is, is only an important part of the machinery which grace employs. We are saved through faith, but salvation is by grace. Sound forth those words, as with the archangel's trumpet, By grace are ye saved. What glad tidings for the undeserving! Faith occupies the position of a channel, or conduit pipe. Grace is the fountain and the stream. Faith is the aqueduct along which the flood of mercy flows down to refresh the thirsty sons of men. It is a great pity when the aqueduct is broken. It is a sad sight to see around Rome the many noble aqueducts which no longer convey water into the city, because the arches are broken and the marvellous structures are in ruins. The aqueduct must be kept entire to convey the current, and, even so, faith must be true and sound, leading right up to God and coming right down to ourselves, that it may become a serviceable channel of mercy to our souls. Still, I again remind you that faith is only the channel or aqueduct, and not the fountainhead, and we must not look so much to it as to exalt it above the divine source of all blessings, which lies in the grace of God. Never make a Christ out of your faith, nor think of it as if it were the independent source of your salvation. Our life is found looking unto Jesus, not in looking to our own faith. By faith all things become possible to us, yet the power is not in the faith, but in the God upon whom faith relies. Grace is the powerful engine, and faith is the chain by which the carriage of the soul is attached to the great motive power. The righteousness of faith is not the moral excellence of faith, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ which faith grasps and appropriates. The peace within the soul is not derived from the contemplation of our own faith, but it comes to us from him who is our peace, the hem of whose garment faith touches, and virtue comes out of him into the soul. See then, dear friend, that the weakness of your faith will not destroy you. A trembling hand may receive a golden gift, the Lord's salvation can come to us, though we have only faith as a grain of mustard seed. The power lies in the grace of God and not in our faith. Great messages can be sent along slender wires, and the peace-giving witness of the Holy Spirit can reach the heart by means of a thread-like faith which seems almost unable to sustain its own weight. Think more of Him to whom you look than of the look itself. You must look away, even from your own looking, and see nothing but Jesus, and the grace of God revealed in Him. End of section 4